I've pulled together a further segment from Lauren Seagrave's speed presentation at the recent IAAF Coaches Conference in London. This portion is primarily about the energy systems and how they relate to sprint training and sprint program design. I've provided some comments at the end of this presentation. Arm and leg coordination. For many years, biomechanists said, well, the arms just basically uh, balance what the legs do. But some of the best biomechanists in the world now are admitting, yes, if you have a faulty arm action and you change it, you can have positive effects relative to what's happening in terms of your legs. Just a little example. If you, sh if you show me a sprinter that comes out of the starting block and their arm is way long back here like this, I can tell you automatically they're over pushing. They're pushing so much that they're continuing extension while they're in the air. And so by basically stopping the arm and getting them to change direction and punch it forward, you're facilitating recovery of the leg on the opposite side. And then last but certainly not least is where does the energy come from? And that's where we're going to start today. When I was studying exercise physiology at the University of Wisconsin in 1972, I know, I don't look it. Um, yeah, Gunter said I've been coaching for 45 years. He forgot to tell you that I was three years old when I started. This confused me so much, this diagram. And what I thought happened is you shift gears and you're in, in ATP, and then that kicks in, and then you go to CP, and then you, you know, your glycolytic kicks in third gear, and finally your fourth gear is your oxidative metabolism. In point of fact, it's all happening at the same time. All systems are working at the same time. What they don't tell you is this, is this is the percentage that that particular energy system contributes in that time frame. So you can see in kind of the, the 10 second range, we're predominantly going to get our energy from stored ATP and stored creatine phosphate. But we're still producing, I mean, y'all are producing lactate while you're sitting here. Otherwise your blood lactate wouldn't be 0.4 to 0.7. The intensity, of the, the intensity of the activity is going to determine how hard we kick in. And then, of course, oxidative metabolism. This is, again, something that in the last 10 years relative to 400-meter um, running has changed a lot in terms of, of what we know. So volitional muscle contraction, you're going to send a message down, and that action potential is going to cross the junction and it's going to release calcium um, into, the, into the space. And this is going to then start a cascade of events that causes muscle contraction. The calcium portion is really important here, okay? To understand that calcium is involved in those initial steps of muscle contraction. In terms of mechanism of contraction, You've got the link between the actin and hopefully heavy chain myosin. And when this particular compound, troponin, works with ATP or adenosine triphosphate, magnesium is also required. It causes these um, two molecules, actin and myosin, to bind and to ratchet together. Consequently, the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. Key point here, magnesium is required, and we're going to figure out where else magnesium is required, because 30 years ago, the Navy SEALs did a ton of studies on strength, and one of the things they did was they intentionally depleted magnesium from some of the SEALs until it was down to a ridiculously low level. 
and they monitored the ability to produce force during this time. The more magnesium deficient the seal was, the weaker they were. And so one of the things, particularly in hot environments, is you lose electrolytes. Magnesium is one of the ones that you lose. And even if you're drinking Gatorade, you're not going to replenish it because there are very few drinks that contain magnesium because it tastes nasty. So this is one thing that you want to get with your, with your uh, doctors and your, your nutritional experts to make sure that your athletes are in the right zone, particularly with some of these uh, small minerals. We can talk about the energy share, and this is, uh, um, I, I take this term and, uh, from Uli Hartman, the energy share that's required in each different event. The energy share that's required in the 100 meters is different than the energy share that we're going to see in the 400 meters. Now we're going to talk primarily about three energy systems. The first one is the, uh, the anaerobic A-lactate, where we're working with ATP. By the way, if you don't have ATP, muscle contraction stops. It's the job of all of the other energy systems to rebuild the ATP molecule. And the creatine... Uh, Creatine phosphate, liberating the energy, is one of the ways that we rebuild that ATP, <clears throat> such that muscle contraction can continue. Now, what the heck is the third one? If you look at most basic uh, exercise physiology books, they don't talk about this. There are some special cats out there that when you start to get high concentrations of ADP in the, in the muscle because of ATP breakdown, they can take two ADP, adenosine diphosphate molecules, they smash them together in what's called the adenylate reaction, and you come out with an ATP and an AMP, adenosine monophosphate. This is not cyclic AMP. This is just AMP. Cyclic AMP controls a lot of the processes of the cell. We're going to talk a lot more about this and, and the implications <coughs> of this, particularly in our 400 meter runners. So ATP resynthesis, <coughs> when we look at rest, you've got the top, uh, the top cycle where we're in, the pro we're in the process of rebuilding the ATP, and that cycles around. Creatine is involved with that. And now you see the, uh, during the bottom is the exercise, where creatine is going to lend its energy to rebuild the ATP. Now, thank you again to Dr. Hartman for allowing me to borrow this slide, um, because you who were here Monday probably recognize it. What you see is, is that ATP stays relatively high during the course of the 100 meters with high intense exercise. However, creatine phosphate drops off significantly. And when you start to get in that 10 second range, you can see that available ATP is less. This is one of the metabolic considerations for why we have a speed maintenance phase in that last phase before the finish in our 100 meter uh, race model. So why did I call it the speed maintenance phase? What happens during this phase to the velocity of the athlete? They decelerate. Well, why don't we call it the deceleration phase? If you call it the deceleration phase, your athletes will not disappoint you. <laughs> This is a concept of neuro-linguistics. We want to talk about and name things about what we want to have happen, not what we want to avoid. <coughs> and so, in these last phases, you can see that um, ATP falls off precipitously, as does velocity. Now, we typically talk in terms of distance. 
the time required for the male athletes that are in the biomechanical studies, less than 10 seconds. Your 13-year-old young female sprinter might be out there for 13 seconds. So you can see that the energetics is dependent on the time that they're producing maximum intensity movement. And so we need to take this into consideration relative to training. This is particularly true in the 400 and the 400 hurdles. You know, we're going to see a lot of people run 48 seconds in the 400 hurdle final for men. But if you look at your young developing athletes and they're running the 400 hurdles or the 400, they could be out there for 65 or 68 or even 70 seconds. And so understanding that that dynamic is dependent on time, not distance, and important when you're writing the training program. Now, if we look at the untrained individual, this is kind of the curve that we see in terms of our, our uh, lactate. And you see it really doesn't start until about three seconds. And it reaches a peak somewhere around eight seconds. And that peak, if we're looking at the, uh, um, the left axis is the percentage of uh, resting, you'll see that it peaks out at about 45 or so. Remember we talked about high glycolytic power. This is the highly trained uh, 100 meter run. And so you can see that our glycolytic system has been trained to kick in much, much sooner with our, with our uh, elite sprinters. Could be partially because of fiber type. But there's also, there's also other considerations, and the, the training actually gets the body to do this. But you can see the, the, the change in lactate, in lactate, the delta lactate. The rate is incredibly high, so the, the slope of the curve is almost vertical. And the amount of uh, lactate in the system of the 100 meter runner is extremely high. Now, when I was a young coach, we thought, well, you really don't develop um, very much <coughs> lactate in the 100 meters, so we really don't need to concern with training this component. And the first person that I talked to was Elio Locatelli, who in 1995 um, took blood samples from the, the earlobe of the 100 meter runners at the national championships. And he found that they were in the range of 14 or 15 millimole. If he would have waited a little bit longer, he may have even found that it would be higher because sprinters don't clear lactate from the muscle as well as distance runners. So wait a little bit longer, it might have been higher. Some of the recent tests using more sophisticated uh, equipment will find 19, 20, 22 millimole after 100 meters. So glycolytic contribution is extreme. It, it happens soon, it happens fast, and there's a lot of it. The information provided here in the second part of the presentation was quite complex, but for me, the value of magnesium and calcium as aids to muscular contraction came across as being very important and something that I'll need to look into. The need to alter training according to the age of the athlete in regard to energy system usage is also something of value and something well worth thinking about when planning training schedules. The explanation surrounding adenosine diphosphate, I'll need to look into that a little bit more and to see whether there's real take home value for me as a coach.